Welcome, everybody. I am here with Alexander Mercurius in London, and I am also here with Glenn Deason. Glenn, where are you joining us from? That's my first uh, question to you. And where can people find you? Which is my second question to you. Well, I'm uh, well. I'm uh, located in Norway. I'm a professor at the University of uh, Southeastern Norway. Um, I. Yeah, I, I started a new LinkedIn account. Uh, no, link, yeah, LinkedIn, but also a Twitter account. So I'm on Facebook or, and Twitter at the moment. But uh, I'm trying to uh, yeah, move towards a safer ground. So I'm also moving into Rumble and, uh, and yeah, of course, tele, uh, Telegram mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, contact yeah, and uh, mm -hmm. yes, uh, platforms with uh, less censorship before. Yes, absolutely, and and also um, you are you are an expert with regards to to what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. Um, Alexander was saying before we started recording this uh, this video, Alexander was saying that he's a huge fan of yours. I know you've written many books. Uh, can you just introduce uh, some of your work very very quickly before we get into the uh, the topic? Uh, sure. Well, uh, my my first books were mostly about uh, uh, the European Russian relationship after after the Cold War. How uh, yeah, the inability to effectively reach a post-Cold War settlement for Europe and the conflict this resulted in. And thereafter, I began to write some books on uh, this Greater Eurasian Partnership, which Russia began to develop after uh, the events of 2014. Thereafter, I've written some books on uh, Russian conservatism, uh, mm -hmm. Jew economics in the Fourth Industrial Revolution, and, uh, and yeah, various books on Russian foreign policy. And, one of the most recent one was a book called uh, Europe as the Western Peninsula of Greater Eurasia, mm -hmm. which explores how this Greater Eurasian partnership is affecting Europe. And uh, in June, in two months, uh, no, sorry, yeah, three months, I will have a, there's a new book coming out called Russophobia, which looks at uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, political propaganda in the international system. So mm -hmm. well, mo mostly the Western propaganda mm -hmm. Against Russia, but not, no, not 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 only recent, but more of a yeah. phenomenon uh, really picking up in the 1800s. Yeah. All right. So um, I'll put all your links in the description box down below mm -hmm. for people mm -hmm. to um, to follow you, as well as uh, links mm -hmm. for your for your books and for your work. And uh, Alexander, I will uh, turn it over mm -hmm. to you and uh, to Glenn. And I think the. Yeah. The first thing we need to talk about are the uh, talks that are taking place right now as we're recording this video in uh, Turkey between the Russians and uh, the Ukrainians. What uh, What's going on? How do you see things? Well, I, I think that the Ukrainians have at some level intellectually accepted that they're never going to, Ukraine is never going to join NATO. I think this has been something that they've intellectually accepted, but they've never actually, I think, seen through the logic of what that means. So they're coming up with various proposals to the Russians about what they call neutral status, except I suspect that when you pour into these proposals in detail, you find that, in fact, it's not really neutral status at all. It would still be a Ukraine essentially very heavily aligned with the Western powers. And I very, very don't much doubt that. I think it's inconceivable that the Russians will accept that. So the Ukrainians have come up with more proposals on this. I think the Russians will do what they always do. They will look at these proposals. They'll come back. They'll say whether or not they are prepared to move forward with them. But in that, whatever form the Ukrainians come up with, I don't think that the Russians will simply accept these proposals as they stand. Now, I'm sure there's other things going on. There's lots of things that are also being discussed about, you know, Ukraine's military position, its armed forces, bases in Ukraine the status of the Russian language in Ukraine, denazification, as the Russians call it in Ukraine, all of these things, uh, the status of Donbass, the status of Crimea. I think we are, if I may say so very much, at an early start of negotiations. But I think also you might just see some proposals about humanitarian corridors and local ceasefires in some of the northern Ukrainian cities. But the major battle in the Donbass, where it's going on, will probably continue until it's finally completed. So that's that's what I think. I mean, in other words, glacial pro progress in negotiations with the Ukrainians intellectually accepting 
that they're not going to join NATO, but unwilling to face up to what that means in, in, in substantive terms. Glenn, your take. Uh, yeah, I largely agree or completely agree uh, because the, I think to understand the where the Russian red lines go, so what they completely demand, you have to look at what, what the problem is. And I think it, this all goes back to uh, 2014 because, and this is something that NATO always recognizes as a challenge as well. If they're going to expand towards Russian borders, it, it has certain problems because Russia, uh, Ukraine has been very divided. So I think for this reason, two, two problems have emerged when you try to bring uh, Ukraine into uh, a divided Ukraine into the Western bloc. The first one is obviously that uh, the eastern parts, the more Rus the Russian-speaking part, that they would uh, uh, f face some oppression in terms of uh, well, the media, in, within media politics, etc. But the second, obviously, having this American and NATO military infrastructure moving mm -hmm. closer towards Russian borders. So mm -hmm. for this reason, this is the two things very important to Russia. They need a neutral Ukraine, uh, not hosting these American weapons, but also... Uh, they need some protection for the Russian speakers. So, so this is uh, largely what was uh, brought into the Minsk II agreement, which mm -hmm. they tried to push through for these seven years, which was, you know, have some autonomy for Donbass, and this autonomy would have allowed also Ukraine prevent uh, NATO from expanding. Uh, but as they saw, it became slowly a de facto member by arming it. So, uh, so I think that this has been the three main. Uh, goals they've had uh, since, since the conflict began. That is, they demand a neutral Ukraine, uh, but after they went to war, they also then want independence for Donbass, and also this third category, as Alexander mentioned, is uh, denazification. Uh, I think it's probably deliberate and ambig ambiguous. Uh, I think mainly what, what, what it's a reference to is all of these uh, groups like uh, Azov and Aydar, all these uh, yeah, mm. using these uh, fascist uh, logos, uh, that that, yeah, they were integrated into the army, uh, the, the Ukrainian army, so they would like to have them uh, yeah, pushed out of the state structures. Now, mm. this is obviously because they brought a lot of uh, misery for people in uh, Eastern mm. Ukraine. But also there could be something strategic behind this. If they would decouple the, the fascist elements from the Ukrainian government, they would likely turn a bit on each other, which would obviously mm. be favorable to Russia mm. as well. So, but I'm just wondering how this agreement will be cemented. If let's say even if we look at one simple thing like neutrality, how would this be organized in an agreement? Because uh, it feels like the era of diplomacy is over. Keep in mind, the Europeans signed a deal with with uh, Donbas in 2000. Uh, no, sorry, with with Russia and Ukraine in 2014 that they would have unity government. But then within 48 hours, the Europeans uh, ignored it and supported the coup. And then in 2015, you had this uh, Minsk II agreement, yeah. which had a peaceful settlement for Ukraine. And, and then they spent the past seven years uh, torpedoing this agreement, undermining it. So I think it's going to be very hard to, I guess, the Russian fear. Well, what, what would prevent them from agreeing to anything is as soon as they have an agreement, you'll be neutral. What, what, what's stopping uh, them from uh, the U.S. from pumping weapons in again and then, you know, backtracking on all these commitments? So... Um, that there's no trust anymore in the system. That's what I mean. It's uh, all our pan-European security agreements have collapsed over the years. So um, yeah. it's very clear to me how these agreements would be uh, would, would be uh, yeah, put, put into words. And that's just the Russian side. Of course, the Ukrainians have their own security concerns, and they would like, you know, if Russia has security, uh, its security concerns uh, recognized in agreements, then the Ukrainians would want the same. So I think, uh, I think it's difficult. And... Uh, the point I've been continuing, continuously made, making is the longer this conflict goes on, the more Russia will, uh, the more resource it pushes into this conflict, the more it will demand in, in, in return. So in other words, on day one, if Ukraine would have surrendered, they could have you know, maybe uh, agreed to uh, neutral Ukraine and then independence for and recognize yeah, Donbass and Crimea, yeah. uh, just so this conflict won't uh, fire up again. But now, the, if, if Russia is taking over more and more territory, at some point, they're going to start to in install, uh, you know, local governance uh, of people who are not favorable of the government in Kiev. Mm. And at this point, uh, they can't be left to their own anymore, if you will. So I think this will, the longer this conflict goes on, the, the less favorable terms the Russian will, will, will agree to. That's my perception, at least. 
I think this is exactly correct. I think it is also, by the way, an important point to understand because I think the Western perception is almost the diametric opposite, that time is somehow on Ukraine's side, whereas the reality is the diametric contrary. The longer Ukraine holds out, the more it resists coming to terms with the Russians, the more difficult the terms Ukraine will, will have to accept. Uh, will be. And I think this is absolutely kept true. But if we go back to Glenn's points, it seems to me that Glenn has put his finger on the whole underlying problem in Ukraine. There are two problems in Ukraine. There's an internal political problem in Ukraine, the profound division within Ukrainian society between Ukrainian speakers, Russian speakers. In my opinion, after the Soviet Union broke up, that could have been settled, there could have been all kinds of arrangements made, it could have been resolved in a peaceful and friendly way between communities which have lived together for centuries and in many cases share the same faiths and even sometimes the same ideological opinions. What exacerbated these problems within Ukraine itself to the point of absolute breakdown and war and what ultimately involved Russia too, was this extraordinary push by the Western powers ever further east into the former Soviet Union. So we've had NATO expansion into first the Baltic states, and to be straightforward about this, talk about NATO expansion into Ukraine, at that summit, that disaster summit in Bucharest, they actually said that Ukraine would one day become a member of NATO. They've constantly said that doesn't really mean anything, but why would the Russians believe them when they say that it won't mean anything? So the constant push eastward of NATO, and I think also similarly, the constant push eastward of the European Union, which has gone hand in hand with all of this. And that has been incredibly destabilizing within Ukraine itself. It's created immense polarizations and tensions within, the, within Ukraine, as many Russian-speaking Ukrainians have felt that this is a policies that have been forced on them, both by internal Ukrainian politicians that take a pro-Western perspective and who want to impose the Ukrainian language and de-Russify Ukraine. So that's one part of it. But it also is also massively alarmed Russia also, who see, of course, Ukraine as an exist for whom Ukraine is an existential issue. So I think we've seen these two things come together. And I think at a fundamental level, European leaders, especially, have never really understood the danger in, the, in what they've been doing. I think they've always assumed that they could push east, that they could support political forces in Ukraine, that they could ignore agreements that they've reached with the Russians, that they could simply keep this agenda constantly moving eastwards and that sooner or later the Russians would accept it. And I think that it's now ended in a massive bang, a terrible war, a war which is going to have disastrous consequences, and which it is now clear is going to have enormous effects on the European economy, which I think European leaders had not anticipated or predicted. So that's, I think, where we are. But it is this policy discussed at great length by Glenn in books, articles, pushing eastward, ignoring Russian concerns, ignoring many internal Ukrainian concerns, not recognizing or realizing where this was all going to end. Right. Uh, going back to what uh, you said, Glenn, I have a question for both of you. Um, why should Russia at this moment in time accept any type of agreement? given everything that's happened to them. I mean, they've, they've been canceled out of Western, um, the Western architecture, that's clear. I mean, there's nothing for them to lose anymore, is there? Uh, there's always the fear of false flags and, and obviously some sort of NATO intervention or, or a wider war or, or God forbid a nuclear war, but mm. why, why should they accept any kind of, uh, of ceasefire or, or peace deal? Because 
it's like you said, whatever they accept at this moment in time from Ukraine is is hollow. There's no trust there anymore. And the U.S. has said that they will not stop. In so many words, they said they will not stop until they achieve regime change. I mean, Sullivan said this is going to be a long war and mm. we're committed to it. Mm. I mean, they're not going to stop, whether it's this year or in five years or in 10 years. So my question is, why should why should Russia not go all the way with this uh, with this operation? Mm-hmm. Well, to, to, to Glenn and, 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 and Alexander, yeah, just yeah. But Glenn, do you want to start? <laughs> yeah, well, I I I, I agree that uh, uh, that that for Russia they see this in a much wider context, which is why they are so very unlikely to want to yield anything uh, or on on this conflict, because from Russia's perspective. This conflict is not primarily about Ukraine. The Ukraine is becoming a symptom of a larger problem. Uh, that is, when the Cold War came to an end, uh, well, in- initially we had disagreements with the Russians that we would have this uh, common uh, European security architecture. We signed all these deals through the 90s in which we would uh, have indivisible security, so one side should not expand security at the expense of the other. We were, we were all committed to not having any more dividing lines altogether. Uh, but then, of course, this is what NATO expansion represented for the Russians. Yeah. It was cancelling the idea of, of a common Europe. And, uh, and effectively, what does it mean if, if, if we in the West said, well, uh, we, we're still going to have the dividing lines, we're just going to move them towards the East. Uh, the, the problem then is we restart a lot of the same dynamic of the Cold War, but ex- ex- uh, except for having fights around the Third World, well, what, what we're fighting now for is where to draw these new dividing lines in Europe. Mm-hmm. And, mm. uh, and 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 again, this is the reason why we have been fighting in Georgia, in Ukraine, also conflict Moldova. Uh, we're, we're trying to establish where the new dividing lines are on the continent. So for, for, for so even if this kind of war would be over tomorrow, the underlying uh, dynamics are still there. We, we we're still going to compete for the for where the dividing lines should be drawn. Mm. Uh, so so that so that's the military aspect, and I don't think. Uh, mm. uh, uh, Again, un- un- unless we would go back to the problems made in 1990s and come up with some real pan-European secur- uh, security mm. deals, I don't think much can be done. Uh, in other words, uh, in terms of the sanctions, I think also mm. uh, Russia is full in on this because uh, yeah. they're, not, they're not sitting there waiting for sanctions to re- be removed so they can crawl back to the West. Instead, what Russia obvi- articulated very clearly in 2014 when the West first mm. supported mm. the toppling Yanukovych, uh, was that they'd given up on this greater Europe uh, that yes. started from Gorbachev and they instead began to embrace this idea of the greater Eurasian partnership. So Europe was replaced with Asia, Germany as the core was replaced with uh, China and, and they're now starting to uh, see this to some extent as an opportunity to have this uh, f- 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 full decoupling and yeah, lean more towards Asia. So I, 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 don't, I don't see uh, why like Russia giving any way. And again, this is not a normative argument. Yeah. I just want to make that point because usually when you, uh, at least in this country, the, you know, the, there's a bit of a lynching mood going on. And uh, when, whenever you say something, how Russia thinks, it's immediately yeah. seen as legitimizing something. I'm just saying, yeah. they're not normative arguments are right or wrong, just yeah. how, how, what Russian arguments or mm. perspectives are and why they're acting the way they are. Sorry, am I? Um, yes, I, I, I think that there is a kind of logic for the Russians to press on to the conclusion, and that may very be, very well be what they come to. I mean, it may very well be that eventually they will come to some kind of regime change decision in Ukraine because they may very well decide that any agreement they reach with Ukraine, any agreement they reach with the Western powers, will not be an acceptable agreement. But the Russians always have to balance um opinion not just within russia but in the outside world they have to keep people like the chinese the indians on side and they have always worked and this is a point that i really cannot emphasize again too strongly i mentioned this right at the start of this program that the russians i think genuinely do not want to take over the whole of Ukraine. I think that they would see this as a burden on themselves at this time. What they want to do is to take this problem of Ukraine that has been such a huge problem for them 
ever since basically the Soviet Union ended and this problem of NATO eastward expansion off the table so that they can go ahead and deal with their pressing internal problems. Now, if they can achieve this by a combination of force and negotiation, I think they will do it rather than go full out for total victory. But if they can't achieve it through that combination of force and negotiation, then, of course, force remains ultimately something that they can always continue to apply. Now, we've had more, dis more information that's come out over the last few minutes. Apparently, there's been Ukrainians have come up with some proposals. The Russians are talking about scaling down their operations in Chernigov and around Kiev. But it's important to say that the main focus of the battle, which is Donbass, there the fight goes on. And I, that's where the bulk of the Ukrainian army is. And that's where uh, uh, most of the fighting will continue. And there's absolutely no ceasefire there. And I predict that that will continue until either the Ukrainians finally do come to terms or until the war itself ends from the Russian point of view in victory. Hmm. I, I think many people are going to uh, interpret what you said, Alexander and Glenn, and they're going to say that um, in Russia, at least, they're going to say that the West cannot be trusted. With a ceasefire or with terms of a negotiation, what do you say about that? I, I think they don't trust the West anymore, and uh, Glenn has explained why. We've had one treaty and agreement after another. NATO, uh, NATO made all those promises. The West made all those promises at the end of the Cold War. Not an inch east. They pretend they didn't make those promises, which must be even more insulting to the Russians to be told that those promises were never made when they obviously and manifestly were. But not in each East was broken. Then there was all those arms control agreements, agreements about restrictions on size of conventional forces, promises that NATO would convert itself less from an alliance, a military alliance towards a more political structure, whatever that meant. There was the NATO-Russia founding uh, act. There was the Russia NATO-Russia Council set up. There were there was the INF treaty, which was then scrapped. All of these agreements have been scrapped. So why should the Russians trust the West? I mean, you know, it, it doesn't make any kind of sense from a Russian point of view that they would want to trust the West. And so I'm sure that they don't trust the West. But if they can do a deal with Ukraine, which they can be reasonably confident that Ukraine would stick to, well, that's another issue. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll say it again. Uh, Glenn, they were confident that uh, the Minsk Accords would be uh, yeah. followed. I mean, Germany and France, they, they yeah. signed on to it. Yeah, well, I, I think this is the main experience. Uh, <clears throat> well, what, uh, what, what Russia has been complaining about for well, yeah. 30 years now is that they sign all these agreements with the West, but uh, one after the other, they're all, um, uh, they, they see the West as simply changing realities on the ground and then um, effectively saying that these agreements don't, doesn't matter anymore. And uh, I think Alexander is very correct. I mean, the, this one, not one inch to the east, which uh, Gorbachev got, this, this agreement was very clear. Uh, but, but still, this is now denied. But but again, all these pan-European security agreements in the 90s, we, we now just pretend that they never happened. That uh, that uh, NATO expansion doesn't uh, undermine Russian security, and uh, yes, Alexander also pointed to this Russia NATO founding act of ninety seven. This was supposed to calm down the Russians, saying, "Okay, listen, we're going to expand anyways, but uh, we promise not to put any permanent combat troops in the new member states." Well, now uh, NATO is saying we can't discriminate against all the new members, which effectively mm -hmm. say we're not going to follow this either. And uh, so, and again, yes, the Minsk agreement, uh, just uh, agreement after agreement, do you see from ABM treaty, INF, yes. all, all of them we have kind of abandoned. So from, I think from Russia's perspective, there can't be any trust because there's no balance. So when, mm -hmm. for example, NATO say they want to negotiate from a position of strength, uh, this is uh, this is a very hegemonic thought, and from my perspective, this has been some of the problems we had since the 90s. Because if mm -hmm. NATO is dominant and it negotiates only from a position of strength, this means that NATO can do effectively what it wants. Meanwhile, yeah. none of Russia's security concern have been taken into account for 30 years. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that legitimizes any actions 
by Russia. I'm just saying that, the, that, that that's how they reach this conclusion, that if they yeah. want to have security, then they have to uh, pursue it by, by force. So... Yeah. So I, I I don't I don't think there's any trust there. And as I mentioned before, I think this is part of the problem with the coming with a diplomatic agreement. Because if every agreement is signed with the West and we we don't honor that agreement, yeah. why, what was the point? You can't have agreements based on trust anymore. They, yeah. they need to have some other uh, solution in place. And I think that's probably and this will uh, this will dominate uh, the, the logic in Russia of how or what kind of post-war settlement they will accept. And uh, yeah, just last a last note. I couldn't agree more. That I think the the narrative is very very strange at the moment. This idea that Russia has been losing. I think uh, uh, if, if you see what's happening in in Donbas now, uh, I think uh, a main all, all the Russian pieces that Russia needs are now falling into place. Yeah. Uh, in the next week or two, I think the situation will be dramatically dramatically changed. I agree. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree with that. Can I? Can I also uh, uh, say that clearly there is no trust in the West, and in advance of these negotiations in Istanbul, the Russians made it absolutely clear that they do not want Western powers participating in the negotiations. They will deal directly with the Ukrainians, but they do not want any West European, any Euro Western interlocutors, any longer involved in the talks. So it is now purely a negotiation, a direct negotiation between Russia and Ukraine. And we'll see whether they come to say any kind of agreement, but it will have to be an agreement which the Russians believe that they can rely upon. And that, I suspect, is going to be very difficult because, of course, Ukraine itself is in a is a is a complex country to put it mildly the political system there is particularly complex but as glenn correctly said the ukrainians are facing a military catastrophe and i really want to emphasize this in donbass and that may be concentrating minds now the U russian negotiator medinsky said that the ukrainians have for the first time come up with a coherent proposal and that's going to be relate to Putin. So we'll see what that means and what that proposal amounts to and any, whether it's anything that the Russians can uh, practically work with. Uh, Medinsky says that uh, they are going to be reducing their military activities near Kiev and Chernikov, like you said, Alexander. Is this a yeah. mistake, guys? Is no. this a mistake no, I, for them? Does this take out the momentum? Does the, does the Western media, one final question, does the Western <laughs> media spin this as as a narrative where you see the Russians were losing in uh, in Kiev and they were getting beaten back by the Ukraine military. So now Ukraine got what they wanted during the negotiations and the Russians have to retreat east. Well, I mean, no, is this a not, losing point for, for no, the Russians not, and Putin? It's not, it's, it's not a losing point. They're not, they're not conceding anything because they haven't made any attempt, as we've discussed so many times in so many programs, to storm either Kiev or Chernigov or any of these places. The reason that they're doing that is because uh, they want to uh, uh, you know, close down these fronts because they've now basically man managed to isolate the Ukrainian army in Donbass. So from their point of view, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a symbolic concession that means nothing in terms of where the main battle is happening. Uh, now, what the West's, how the West spins it is not something, I think, that is within Russia's control. And, I mean, the West hardly reports the fighting in the Donbass at all, hardly reports the situation even in Mariupol to any, in any substantive way. So given that that is so, I don't think the Russians are particularly bothered about what the rest spins about this. I agree. I think uh, I, I've been cautioning about the same, well, what I would yeah, consider to be wishful thinking, because uh, yeah. you see this argument coming that, uh, well, every time you look up in the media, they suggest yeah. that... Uh, the Russian storming of uh, Minsk and has, has been, uh, no, sorry, of, of Kiev has been uh, is being pushed back. But but they never have they never received any orders to storm uh, Kiev. Uh, that that would require a lot of uh, bombing and initial preparation. Mm -hmm. so, so I think people will miss the fact that uh, over the past uh, eight years the war has been fought in Donbas, and this is where Ukrainian forces mobilized in the tens of thousands. This is where the Ukrainian 
uh, best military forces are as well. This is also where more of the vicious and fierce forces, being at Azov and the rest, are also concentrated. So this is uh, this is the main battlefield, which is Donbass. So uh, so so I think now that um, uh, the, the, this this conflict in Donbass is reaching. Uh, and then we see like final stand now in the area around the Krim yeah. Krimatorsk. I think that uh, this will change uh, the, the entirety because once uh, they defeat the Ukrainian army in Donbas with the tens of thousands uh, of, of forces being lost there, th that will uh, free up a huge amount of Russian Chechen troops, uh, which can then be put put further pressure on on the Ukrainian state. Also, I always point out that wars are largely about logistics. And, uh, and uh, well, part of the reason why Russia hasn't gone in so far yet is because it needs to keep it, uh, its, its um, uh, what's called supply chains, uh, not supply chains, uh, uh, yes, <laughs> it's, it's a supply chain, yeah. yes, supply chains open uh, for, yeah. you know, gasoline and armament. Yeah. And uh, Mariupol has been a key uh, yeah. a problem in this from, from connecting uh, mm. Donbass with with uh, uh, Kherson and, and Crimea, but but my, my, my point is once that the Donbass issue is resolved uh, for, for the Russians, uh, the whole logistic issue uh, yeah. also itself. So the primary the primary objective of Russia to capture Donbass is resolved. You can then connect these regions uh, within uh, Ukraine, and uh, and and, and this is going to change uh, pretty much everything. So. Uh, well, so I, I don't I don't think if if they pulling a bit back from Kiev if this helps to facilitate some negotiations I think uh, I don't yeah. I don't see it making uh, I don't think mm -hmm. I don't see this as a withdrawal or a defeat uh, I think yeah. that again, uh, this belongs to the yeah. realm of the information war not the actual war absolutely can I just also say that apparently Ukraine has also to offer to discuss the Crimean crest question. So we'll see what they're what they're doing. Something that they've absolutely refused to do up to this point. So we'll see where all this goes. But at the moment, it seems as if actually Ukraine has given some ground in these negotiations. But as you absolutely rightly said, uh, um, Alex, I think there's very little trust. And of course, what they're also trying to do is they're trying to freeze out to the extent that they possibly can the western powers to prevent the western powers interfering in these negotiations which i think would complicate them and make them very difficult but how did you freeze out the west ah. after all of this concludes because well, that, uh, i'll go that, back yeah. to my first question yeah. to my first yeah. point my first question yeah. the the neocons are not mm. going to go away they're not no. going anywhere and they've been very clear mm. crystal clear mm. they will not end until this will not end until they get regime change in Russia. Yeah. So I mean, how do you how do you freeze them out of Ukraine? How do you end this? How do you stop them with their fixation on destroying Russia? Uh, I'm just trying. I'm, I'm trying well, to figure it out. Even a negotiated settlement in Ukraine to me seems like okay. Maybe it's a temporary pause yes. in the neocons' plans, but it's not going to stop them. I mean, in no. three, four, five years, it's just going to come back again. And like no. Ben said, no. they'll try to it's do another coup. We'll try to do another regime change, and no. they'll try to uh, to stir things up again. I, I, I mean, it, it, it's a fundamental problem that the Russians have, and one must be very clear. I think that they basically want to resolve the situation in Ukraine, but the longer, greater problem of the pressure from the United States, of course, that can't be resolved in 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 the, in this kind of way. But that's where we come back to Glenn's major topic, which is the Greater Eurasian Partnership, the alliance with China, or at least the de facto the strategic partnership with China, the forging of deeper economic links, uh, the setting up of alternative financial systems, all of those kind of things. That, that I think, is the ultimate long-term game plan. But they have to resolve the situation in Ukraine, because if they don't, then that's going to be the major, the major immediate problem for them. So I think that's what it's, you know, that's what I think the ultimate Russian game plan is. Because if the Ukrainians draw back, if they don't move forward with these proposals that they're apparently making, if they prevaricate further on NATO membership, if they try to 
get a kind of NATO membership, which isn't a formal membership, but which appears to be that. Well, at that point, of course, um, um, the, the Russians, as I said, will eventually impose their own decision, their own outcome on the situation in Ukraine, and then the negotiations will fall apart. But if they can separate Ukraine, the Ukrainian problem, from the greater global problem of this confrontation with the West and the United States, then, as I said, it will put them in a stronger position going forward as they forge ahead with their greater Eurasian partnership with Russia, with China, as they bind together Central Asia, the uh, Caucasian states, and perhaps some of the other Central Asian states outside what was the Soviet Union, Iran, Turkey, and the rest. Uh, Glenn, what do you think about that? And uh, do you think that if Putin does agree to uh, these terms, and, and just to let you guys know, I'm on Telegram and Twitter, and I'm seeing the reaction, especially from the Russian side of things, from people that are just chiming in, anecdotal, of course, but um, people are very upset yeah. with Russia possibly agreeing to these terms. I think this has been exacerbated by the uh, the POW video and all of these things that have come I out. I mean, there's a lot of emotion now in this, but I'm telling you right now, um, if these are the terms that Russia yeah. decides to yeah. agree on, security guarantees, having countries actually be able to impose no-fly zones like China, Turkey, Israel, et cetera, well, we, we have, we uh, don't the ceasefire, yeah. we don't know. I'm just, um, this is anecdotal. Yeah. Once again, yeah. this is yeah. I'm just I know. giving you guys the vibe of yeah. what I'm seeing yeah. right now as yeah. this stuff is trickling in. Uh, there's a lot of uh, anger from the yeah. Russian side of things that, you know what, if Putin agrees to this, then we're, we're going to get uh, we're going to get betrayed again. We're, we're going to get screwed yeah. over. I'm, well, I'm just reading you guys what I'm seeing right now. Yeah. Well, that's the interesting part when uh, we in the West uh, dream about this uh, regime change in Moscow. We often forget that Putin is not really considered part of the hardliners in Russia. I mean, yeah. if, yeah. If, if, if he goes out, there's not going to be a, a more liberal, Western-friendly uh, leader in place. So, But I, but I, I, th I think this, uh, the, some of this anger could, again, it goes back to this idea that uh, the problem in Ukraine is, uh, is, uh, is a double problem. On one hand, you have this divided Ukraine, which they want to have a solution to, uh, but uh, also in conflict with Russia. But it also, this is a symptom of this larger problem, which is that of a divided Europe. And one has to be honest that the US objectives here, uh, despite the rhetoric, is not simply to protect the, you know, democracy and human rights. The uh, US has very clear objectives. And, and this, this conflict uh, is providing some, some benefits from the United States as well. For, first of all, this is splitting Ukraine from Russia. This is uh, creating animosity. That, that, that's an objective. But also, as long as the war continues, we see that the Americans are also achieving this uh, disconnect between the Europeans and the Russians. Again, for years now, the Americans have been trying to use European security dependence on the United States to extract uh, economic uh, uh, loyalty. So effectively, you know, stop buying Russian gas, for example. And uh, so, you know, this is not a very well-hidden secret that uh, there are many now in Washington, um, uh, especially among the neocons, who would like to see Ukraine become sort of a new Afghanistan, something that drains away the resources, the weak, gradually weakens Russia, possibly leads towards regime change. Well, again, also forcing the Europeans to have more, uh, impose this block loyalty, if you will. Um, so I, uh, so I think that this is the main, the, the main, uh, one of the key problems. Because even if you in, in, in cut the Americans out of negotiations, they they will not go away for that, uh, you know, for, uh, if they're not part of it. So you know, the problem is once Russia goes out, will the Americans and NATO come sh straight back in? And, and obviously, this is something uh, that, that, that's a big consideration towards the Russians. I guess what they're hoping on is for the U.S. to soften up its stance a bit when they have to take into account other variables. So other, yeah. For example, when we push Russia away from Europe, it, it doesn't end up in isolation. It ends up in the East instead with China mm -hmm. and also now with India, as we now see uh, beyond NATO and Japan, Australia, there's not the rest of the world's not really joining in on this sanction. So mm -hmm. they're mainly handing over huge markets to its main rivals. And furthermore, I think maybe the, the, they're hoping that Europeans will rein in the Americans yeah. a bit as well, because um, it's not maybe in the Europeans' interest to have this Afghanistan in the center of Europe, that this is not mm -hmm. something that is in, in our interest. So yeah. uh, 
I wouldn't be surprised if you see a bit louder voices coming out of France after a while, suggesting that uh, you know we have to deal address this topic of this uh, yeah. uh, Cold War legacy, which is the, the absence of a European security architecture, one that's uh, you would, that will continue to have these dividing lines in Europe, which will continue to fuel these issues. Because at the moment, uh, this is um, a divided Europe is now becoming increasingly yeah. less and less relevant. Yeah. Yes. Europeans must retreat under America, and Russia must now retreat more towards China. While Russia would have favored a more, uh, more diversified economic partnerships, but now without Europeans and Americans, they have to lean excessively on the Chinese, which is not in uh, the Western's interest either. So I think uh, a lot of this possibly can soften up the Americans, but uh, yeah. I, I definitely think that Moscow sees the U.S. as being uh, a key, uh, the, the main obstacle, if you want, to a permanent settlement in Ukraine. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would agree with that. I think that the feeling, and not just in Moscow, but I think even in some places in Europe now, is that what the United States is working towards is a war in Ukraine to the last Ukrainian as a way of bleeding Russia. I think that's, that's, that's what the... Uh, uh, um, Russians think. I think that's what a lot of the Europeans think. I think it's what the Americans think, and I suspect it's increasingly what many Russian, uh, what many Ukrainians also are thinking. We have to wait and see what kind of a deal is being done. But the more uh, I'm get, the more information I'm getting is that it looks increasingly also as if Ukraine is preparing to give up the Donbass. That that seems to be what the uh, Ukrainian. Um, representatives are saying we haven't seen what this draft that the ukrainians have put together says and clearly there's been an awful lot of work in the negotiations going on over the last couple of weeks so we'll see what it all amounts to and whether or not this is in fact something that the russians can work with but can i repeat again we haven't seen the text we don't know what exactly has been agreed we don't know who's giving which ground but all the indications at the moment are that it's the ukraine that's giving the greater ground at the moment mm -hmm. all right. i yeah, guess that also right. makes sense given that uh, now, now that donbass is falling uh, exactly. this is uh, exactly that this is a game changer for the Ukrainians now. Exactly. From now on, once Donbass is resolved and this is this will not come back, uh, for every day they wait now, they will see Russia strengthens in the in the other regions. And if they start installing favorable government, local governments from Kherson to Kharkov uh, or even Odessa, then these regions might be gradually slip away further and further from Ukraine, moving towards uh, secession in the future. So yes. I really think that the pressure is mounting on Ukraine now to. Uh, even though they're not happy with this deal now, that uh, this recognition that reality dictates it's either a yes. bad day or a worse one tomorrow. So I think exactly. yeah, uh, this is what's exactly. forcing people to the negotiation. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I should say there's going to be another negotiation tomorrow, another day of negotiations oh. tomorrow. So we'll see what it is. But clearly the Ukrainians have come up with a proposal which the Russians feel that they can work with. And we'll see what it amounts to and whether it comes to anything. But regardless of what happens over Ukraine, the big bifurcation, the great division in the world between the Russian-Chinese Greater Eurasian Partnership and what's left of the West, I think that's now hardened up. And I'm sure that's something we're going to be discussing at much greater length in future programs, because I could certainly see that um, this division, which is now to my mind, I mean, we've now reached a kind of breaking point on it. We'll see, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have an awful lot more to discuss about that in the future. Mm -hmm. well, just it's worth adding also, you mentioned this uh, desire by the Americans perhaps to fight down to the last Ukrainian. I think some in Europe are now wondering if the Americans are willing to sanction Russia down to the last euro as well, because... Uh, Europeans will back carry most of the economic burden of these sanctions. We keep talking about isolating Russia, but you see the Europeans are now uh, might isolate themselves. Uh, this, this will have so many consequences. And again, these sanctions are very much, uh, yeah, they're causing a lot of pain in Russia, but one has to be realistic. These are one-off sanctions because these market shares will not go back to the West. So I think uh, exactly. uh, just uh, we, we forget that Russia sits on a lot of these resources. And in the West, yeah. we've had a very neoliberal market efficiency in terms we're very reliant on these uh, supply chains that we're not used to major disruptions. 
And this is despite coming out of COVID. And uh, I think for, for energy, uh, this alone will be a huge problem. This whole idea that we can live without cheap Russian gas. Um, we, first of all, it's not possible to disconnect from the Russians. And on Thursday, I think that's when they will start the ruble, petro ruble, and not the, allowing any more dollars or euro for the gas. I think what, what, what we're going to see is uh, uh, if, 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 if they don't want the Russian gas, if they yes. try to force uh, less LNG from other places, uh, look, look what the debates are going on in France now. They're, they're very worried. And of course, uh, Germany with twice the industry, uh, you know, you need cheap energy to have uh, competitive industries. All of the European, in the, Europe is about to get very expensive and industries will be yes. very competitive. And that's just energy. If you look at the food, food shortage, you have the metals like nickel prices. God, what happened? It, they more than tripled. And and of course, at the end, you have the currency and the financial system. Uh, uh, if uh, how, how is this going to absorb this blow uh, by more and more countries decoupling? I mean, we, we keep talking about China and Russia, but Indeed, India's also, they're looking at, uh, you know, the pharma industry leaving Russia. They're very eager to come back, uh, to come in and replace mm -hmm. most of it. Mm -hmm. China also wants a huge chunk of this market share. Uh, they're all eager in having energy deals in their local currencies, in rupees, in, in uh, the Chinese one. Uh, it's just uh, across the board. Uh, the rest of the world is seeing this uh, as a huge opportunity to, to, to get in on the Russian market. So I think um, at, at some point... Uh, there will be fragmentations in, in, in Europe especially. And I think this idea that this is causing all this solidarity, I think that's the initial reaction in the West. But I think you will see more and more divisions now that the economic consequences are starting to come in. Yes, indeed. I, 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 would agree with, I would agree with all of that. I think the important point to say about the talks today, by the way, is that all that has happened up to now is that the Ukrainians have made a proposal which the Russians have said they will look at. They've not agreed to that proposal. And all that they've done is they said this is a more substantial proposal, a more coherent proposal than that up to now, and that they're scaling down some of their operations around Kiev and Chernigov, which, as I said, is not where the major battle is. Now, we haven't got the details on these proposals yet, but it does seem as if Ukraine is accepting that it's not going to be a member of NATO, though we don't yet know fully what that means and what the detail of this is going to be. Hmm. All right. Any final uh, comments before we wrap up this video? Well, we, we, we've been caught on a big day, and I should point out we've got negotiations still between the Ukrainians and the Russians tomorrow. These have been very short negotiations today, by the way. I mean, these have only lasted for you know a couple of hours. So clearly this has been worked on both by the Ukrainians and the Russians for some time. So, you know, we, we may be a little bit surprised by, you know, things, but clearly things have been in the works for some time. But, you know, we mustn't lose sight of the bigger picture. I think the Ukrainian crisis may be resolved after a fashion now, but, you know, that's not even certain. But the greater picture of global confrontation, the division of the world into blocks, the crisis in the international economy which is going to deepen all of that now is fixed uh, 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 and sure and i'm sure we will be talking with glenn many times about these issues glenn any final thoughts i think putin is too soft on uh, on europe a lot of people say that in russia oh i know it is true i mean americans people in the west will be shocked when i say that mm. but it is true that a lot of a lot of uh, people in russia and a lot of people in the kremlin see Putin as having uh, too much of a soft spot, especially yeah. for Germany, especially for Europe. Yeah. And, and I know a lot of people are going to say, what are you talking about? He's he's super hardliner. Not, yeah. not in Russia. Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> that, that's what people uh, keep me missing as well, that he's, uh, he's, he's not this hardliner compared to uh, his colleagues, but I think uh, I think a lot of Russians would like to see this, uh, like the, con the conflict with the United States will move on, but I think many would be happy to see it uh, come to an end in, in, in Ukraine, because I think for many Russians, this has been, yeah, seeing Russians and Ukrainians killing each other has been, uh, yeah, just uh, excruciating, that this is something that they would want to see an end to as well. I mean, my former uh, head of my department, when I worked in Moscow, he, right before the war, he wrote an article saying that Russia should uh, bring take this conflict to the uh, puppet master, not the puppet. So in other words, uh, not 
uh, you know, not uh, avoid having a conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Instead, find ways of putting pressure on the United States to uh, reach some agreement on pan-European security. And uh, I guess uh, I would assume that many Russians are have had the same uh, sentiment that uh, they, yeah, they they don't like uh, having Ukraine as being the yeah. the place of a proxy war between Russia and and uh, NATO. Uh, but um, yeah, no, I pray that this uh, uh, something will come out of these talks and uh, uh, this uh, horrible chapter yeah. of a uh, war in Europe can come to an end. But uh, definitely, I don't think uh, I think what Russia uh, or Putin then is prepared to do uh, in terms of uh, fighting against the United States and the Europeans. Uh, I, I think um, I, I think we neglected a lot of this because we we keep going back to this assumption that uh, Russia somehow just wants to. Uh, learn, learn to live with these sanctions until they're let back into Europe. But uh, mm-hmm. again, this uh, greater Eurasian partnership they keep talking about, this is, uh, this is not just uh, some temporary uh, issue to, to get around the sanctions. For many in Russia, they see this as being a correction to a 300-year-long 300, 300 mistake, which has been since Peter the Great, this uh, uh, Western-centric foreign policy, that they always had to look towards the West for modernization, but now they have the rise of the East for the first time in the century, and they don't have to rely so much on the West anymore. So, uh, so I think um, uh, I, I think the economic consequences will will, will, will be immense. And uh, yeah, personally, I would prefer to see this take more form of a economic war than a uh, military mm-hmm. war. So uh, yes, God willing, will uh, this uh, yeah, conflict will come to an end soon. Mm. All right. Fantastic. Uh, Alexander Bakuris and Glenn Deason. Once again, Glenn, I will put all your information down below in the uh, description box where people can uh, can find you, follow you, as well as links to your books. Take care, everybody.